Unlabeled Leadership is a volunteer service. We appreciate our guests for their stewardship and remarkable stories. We also appreciate listeners like you who back the show with star reviews and contributions. Gary DePaul with Unlabel Leadership. Welcome to episode 137, Ed Muzio, Culture, DEI, and Systemic Thinking. Here's a shout out to listeners in New Hampshire, particularly in Peterborough, Derry, and Seabrook, and in New Jersey, Sterling, and Boonton. With that, let's get started. Ed is a management consultant who works with teams at all levels, from the C-suite to the frontline management. He helps them learn to adapt, think systemically and iteratively. In a previous episode, number 33, Ed Muzio upgrades managerial teams. Ed explains his iterative approach, or what he calls iterative management, which I encourage you to listen to, especially with this episode. I also encourage you to listen to another episode that Ed was on called Ed Muzio Demystifies Culture. That's number 109. That episode explains a little bit of what we talk about in this particular episode. In the Unlabeled Leadership Podcast, I try to avoid using terminology and instead describe behaviors about leadership. On occasion, I'll have special episodes where I work with a guest to demystify certain terms. I also try to avoid any acronyms, especially in titles, and this episode is an exception. I did include DEI in the title, which of course stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In episode 23, my DEI expert, Sima Lieberman, explains each of those terms. Since then, DEIB has become very popular. The B stands for belonging. In the show notes, you're going to find a report from the University of California at Irvine, which has a page that defines each of those terms. I'm going to read you the one about belonging. Belonging is the feeling of security and support when there is a sense of acceptance, inclusion, and identity for a member of a certain group or place. It is the fundamental drive to form and maintain lasting, positive, and significant relationships with others. These relationships can be extended to the organization and its values and the work itself. In this episode, Ed and I discuss culture and DEI. We do so from the perspective as management consultants, not as DEI experts. We talk about systemic thinking, and Ed references iterative management, which he defines in episode 33. A system is a set of interrelated parts that lead to goals or objectives with feedback loops. When you're thinking systemically, you're looking at the effects of the whole system. With that as background, I think we're ready to get to the three parts. Part 1. The Organizational Immune System It is not easy to change a culture, and it's probably a lot harder to get employees to internalize diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I start this part of the episode by sharing an observation that I notice with my colleagues who are DEI professionals. Here is how I start the discussion. I've been noticing on LinkedIn that there's several professionals in DE&I that are expressing frustration with their role and executing their role. It seems that there are organizations that are really beginning to feel the challenge to do DEI projects, but there's some issues about sustainability and there seems to be a struggle about trying to get these types of strategies initiated. I think that's right. I think you and I are noticing the same thing, Gary, which is there was a sort of hill to collectively climb to realize the importance of the e and work and to realize that it is not a sideline to the rest of what the organization is doing, but it is actually beneficial all around, meaning it's beneficial in sort of quantitative ways to how well the organization performs and it's beneficial to the sort of value side of things and what the organization is in the world. That was a hill to climb. And I think what you're saying is what I'm seeing, which is that as we've collectively climbed that hill, the next hill you see is, oh, doing it is not so easy. And recognizing the importance does not equal doing it. Getting it to happen and getting it to stick is a whole other mountain and probably a much bigger mountain in some ways than, than the recognition one, but it comes second. And I think that's where a lot of those people are. 
you and I were both in this performance improvement area where we try to help organizations make sustainable changes. There are some systemic things about the organization that actually makes implementations difficult or change difficult, and it's not realized by the people in those organizations. I think that has something to do with the DNI unsustainability. Absolutely. You know, I always tell people I'm, when I introduce myself, I'm kind of a weird guy because I'm a guy that will work with an executive team all at once, all together, and we will change the way the company runs in four months. And that's weird. And the way I know how to do that is by recognizing it as systems work. That has some interesting implications. Like your system has an immune system. Like I have an immune system. You have an immune system. I am not consciously aware of my immune system, but it fights certain kinds of changes for me, sometimes in ways that are beneficial to me and sometimes not in ways that are beneficial to me. I have a lot of allergies right now, so maybe this is on my mind here in Austin. <laughs> That's the thing that I think you have to really start paying attention to is what is happening systemically and automatically because all of the intention in the world for me not to sneeze doesn't stop me from having allergies. If I can help the system in a way, that might. And that's the same thing in the organization is we have to start looking at what's in place system-wide that automatically slows change and also what's in place system-wide that in particular gets in the way of this kind of change, which we realize is so important. Then the question comes is that if you're in an organization, you're in an executive role and you invite DEI initiatives, you hire people to drive them. You want the change, you say you're receptive to the change, but the immune system of your organization kicks in. That becomes the challenge. So what are some of the immunities that come into play? Well, and that's kind of what this whole conversation is about. I think you and I have already had a more general conversation about system change and the immune system and kind of how, yeah. you know, how the system gets in its own way in some sense, although it's also well-designed in some sense. When we're talking about DE&I in particular, I always sort of start with, let's think about some things that could be true about an organization that relate to not whether it is good in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but whether it would be receptive to improvements in that space. A simple example, imagine two people that are not diverse in this organization, and they get into a disagreement about how to proceed. Is that okay? Is that something that, oh yeah, we tend to disagree and we tend to work it out? Or is that like something that provokes an allergic reaction inside the organization and somebody has to be quiet and stuff it and the other person has more seniority or whatever? That's not a fundamental DEI issue. It relates to DEI. You might argue that DEI helps with that issue, but you can also argue that working on that issue would help an organization become more receptive to DEI as a whole. And that's kind of where I think this conversation goes is what are the aspects of the organization? And we'll talk about a couple of them here, but you know, what are the aspects of the organization that you could look at and say, this will tend to help or hurt any efforts we make in the DEI direction? I think back on Judy Hale's podcast episode where she talked about the man in the brown suit. This was decades ago with her father. And she explains in one of the parts of the episode that her father will walk into a room, have executives there. They're all wearing black suits or blue suits with black ties except for one person wearing a brown suit. And her father would gravitate to the person in the brown suit because that's the person who's different, who's willing to listen and accept new ideas. One of the things that comes up with organizations is how receptive are they really about new ideas? Do you have a situation where you actually mentioned this in the white paper you wrote on this, that you could have a project moving forward Things are going wrong, but people are afraid to raise it because it's a career limiting move. Exactly. And that's one of the two areas I talk about in the white paper is, and we should make that available to your listeners for sure, is environmental receptivity is what I call it, which is exactly what you're talking about. It's sort of the extent to which the organization has a culture that says, you know, we're going to have some difficult decisions. We're going to have some situations where we have to make a hard trade off. We're going to have some situations where things didn't go as planned. In general, when those kinds of things come up, do we hide them and whitewash them and pretend they don't exist and worry about them? Or do we come together and have a meeting and make a concerted effort to kind of pay attention to the different viewpoints around the table and figure out how to work something out and make some decision that is both timely, which means it might not be a full consensus, but also fully informed and fully committed so that it gets deployed in a coordinated way. DEI relates to that. If it's a Venn diagram, there's overlap, but that's not fundamentally DEI work, but it sure does make DEI work more or less sticky.
I completely agree. One of the things that you bring up in your white paper is that you would want to welcome respectful disagreement. This reminds me of something that Patrick Linciani talks about is that you go into a room, you're with the decision makers, everything is transparent, you talk it out, you openly disagree. But once the decision is made, you may respectfully disagree with the decision. But once you walk out, you need to support that decision. If you have disharmony in the sense of execution, then you're going to run into sabotage. And that seems to be a, a norm that some organizations have where we walk out of the room and people go, oh, this is a terrible idea, but we're doing it anyway. It's not my fault. Come on, guys, let's go ahead and do it, you know? Well, we could do a whole podcast episode about what Lencioni is talking about there, what I talk about as disagree and commit decision making. My mentor actually studied under the same people as Lencioni and his mentor. So we're in the same family there. The key thing, you're, you said it exactly right, which is the decision doesn't count unless it's fully implemented. And you have this really difficult situation where, let's say we have a manager who is with his or her team, and the whole team knows that manager is going in to propose a certain point of view, and that point of view does not get adopted. That manager has to come back. And on the one hand, that manager has to say, this is the direction we're going, not this is the direction they're going, but we're not doing it. So mm -hmm. the manager has to carry the execution and support the execution. On the other hand, if the manager comes back and says, yep, I drank the Kool-Aid, I see it that way, I agree, then he or she will lose credibility with the team because they know how that person was going in. It's not particularly difficult, but it's often conceptualized the wrong way. It has to come back with, we as a management team decided this, you all know I would have preferred to go a different way. We in this company win by taking turns doing things we disagree with because coordinated execution is more important than full personal agreement, and it's our turn. If you find more contrary evidence that shows this is the wrong direction, please bring it to me and I'm free to bring it back to the management team and I will do that. But in the meantime, it is a job expectation that you will fully implement in the way that we all commit to do. That little sort of compartmentalization of disagree is a thing, commit is a thing, they can happen simultaneously is super important to management decision making in my body of work. As you can imagine, it's also pretty important and useful when you start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because that's the way you can reconcile different points of view, different data sets, different life experiences, different recommendations in such a way that, yeah, we're going to pick one. And it's not always going to be the one everybody wants because everybody wants different things, but it's okay. The differences are still okay and they still exist and they still support us in a broader sense. And we welcome that. That's a key thing. Part two environmental receptivity and behavioral flexibility. Relevant to our conversation about strengthening DEI initiatives is the concept of environmental receptivity. Ed explains what that is, then he explains what behavioral flexibility is. Here's Ed. We already kind of mentioned environmental receptivity and this idea that is the culture receptive to differing viewpoints and difficult decisions. So that's environmental receptivity. Fundamentally, when you come in with, hey, DE&I needs to improve here, that is a need for change involving differing viewpoints and difficult decisions. So if that's the first time the organization has ever dealt with one of those or dealt with it well or admitted to it, then you've got a whole other hill to climb. That's the environmental piece. And that has to do with things like, does the leadership and senior management see it as their job to make transparent and fair decisions and explain them, especially for unpopular decisions? Or do they see it as their job to kind of decide behind closed doors and announce firmly? Or do they sort of see it as their job to kind of avoid commitment completely and let the organization kind of sort it out without direction? Things like that come into this issue of how receptive is the environment to tricky things. The other thing that comes into play, and, and this is the one we haven't talked about yet, is what I call behavioral flexibility. And that is, to what extent does this organization have a culture that enables it to intelligently sort of contemplate and adopt new behaviors? Is there a continuous improvement idea relative to how we do things around here? Or is there a We've done it the same way for the past hundred years and we're not going to change it kind of idea. Is there a, a thing about decisions? When we have a decision, we go out looking for contrary information from subordinates before we make it, especially if it has high stakes. Or do we have a thing about decisions where it's like we tend to sort of curate information to match what the boss already thinks to minimize conflict? You know, you could look at that as a DE&I thing, but you could also look at it as just a, a room full of undiverse people with poor DE&I 
could still handle decisions in either of those two ways. And if they handle them in the in the way that provokes less intelligent change or no change, then the e is going to have a hard time getting traction because the system, like we talked about before, is not equipped or enabled or geared up for those kind of things to happen in terms of change. I'm going to pull from the previous episode that we did on culture. What I'm going to pull from that is cultural habits or organizational habits. You may be receptive and say, yes, I want to improve how we diversify, how we're inclusive. We want to change our systems so they're more equitable. But in practice, it's a little bit different when you get to behavioral flexibility because you're getting into having to expose habits that may not be healthy and then having to deal with it. There's a different level of receptivity about changing habits that are historically grounded into the culture. Absolutely. Have we changed habits before? When a change in behavior is needed, maybe we had a situation a number of years ago where we had to change something big, like what market we're in, or even something small, like, I don't know, our people management software, you know, our, our performance evaluation software. What happens? Do people sort of, yeah, people have hesitancy about change, of course. Do they sort of mix that in with some curiosity and openness and, and kind of an awareness of the mechanics of change? Or does it sort of turn into a, some people take the pro side and some people take the con side, and then we have an argument between them and we see who yeah. wins? Because that's not a good model for decision making or change. That's not going to help you in any change. And certainly, the more DEI is needed in an organization, the more that represents big, substantial behavioral change. DEI could be an opportunity to making explicit what those habits are and really scrutinize are these particular habits beneficial for the organization? There's some comfort because we keep doing it, but is it really best for the organization to do it? What are those habits that we should start adapting and then go through the process that we described in the previous episode about how do you get to changing a habit? And I think that's where there's a really interesting kind of delineation for the practitioners of DEI, which is you sort of start to nudge in the DEI direction. And maybe one of these habit services like, oh, we're in the habit of not tackling hard decisions, or we're in the habit of taking a pro and con kind of stance, like I just said. You've hit a moment there as a DEI practitioner, which by the way, I am not, but, but this is my sort of systems perspective. It's very easy to say, oh, we have to push harder on DEI to solve this issue. That might work. It might not. You could say, oh, we can't get any further with DEI until we solve this issue. And I'm not sure what to do about that because it's a complex cultural issue. That's also not an unreasonable perspective to take, but it does kind of stall things out. What I'm advocating for is to say, take that as a learning, like you just said, like, okay, we see this cultural pattern. Maybe in this case, we need to fall back to influencing that cultural pattern as under the umbrella of the DEI work, maybe or maybe not, but as a necessary precursor in this case to move it forward. So it's not the DEI work that will get it there. And it's not throw my hands up in the air, culture is unchangeable, we can't get there. It's this third thing of, oh, we're going to have to do systemic culture change. Most of these issues we're talking about are management culture, which is, of course, my focus and my bias. We're going to have to do systemic culture change in management culture to move ourselves to a more receptive state so that we can then get the rest of the way there or make further progress with the DEI work. Part three, what should your organization do? If you recognize that your organization has opportunities to strengthen your culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion, what do you do? In this part, Ed takes on this question. Here's Ed. In these conversations, I think the question often comes up, so what's first? Should we do DEI first or should we do some sort of management culture work like iterative management in preparation? At the highest level, I think the answer is kind of unsatisfying, which is there are no hypothetical organizations. There are only real ones. It's not what should an organization do. It's what should your organization do. That's important because your organization is thinking about this. You're thinking about this for a reason. And maybe that reason is you've really pushed hard on DEI and you're not happy with the traction, the results, how far you've moved it, like they talk about in the McKinsey white papers or in the Gartner white papers, where it's like, we're not getting as far as we want. And if that's the case, then maybe it makes sense to say, okay, we're not going to set that aside, but we're going to look momentarily at management culture. Maybe we have, for example, some people in the system who are, you know, executives who don't heavily resonate with the idea of DEI, but they do heavily resonate with the idea of more adaptable output and faster change. You know, I always talk about when the executive turns the wheel, does the ship turn? 
if that is attractive to those people, maybe we work on that in that way and we put in some of these systemic behaviors that support that. Oh, by the way, they also make the next wave of DEI work much more likely to get further and stick more than it has. On the other hand, maybe we have an organization that has never touched DEI and has tried some work in the management culture space. Maybe it makes more sense to enter on the DEI side for that organization and say, you know, we haven't done this before. We have a strong recognition of its importance. We have some good tools to work on it because that will have knock on effects on our culture. Certainly, when the DEI work gets good traction and good attention, it does have knock on effects to the culture, right? That's a benefit in the other directions. It's certainly not wrong to start there either. You have to get a little bit analytical about what have we been doing, what is working, what is not, where are the sticking points for DEI, where are the sticking points for, as we talked about in general, behavioral flexibility and environmental receptivity. Then from there, start to look at do these things go together? Do we make a roadmap? Do we start here or there and really make a plan specific to the one organization and its budget and its needs? You have to look at your organization to realize where you're at so you know where to go or how to start or what iterative steps you can take to get to that end result that you're desiring. But without that, just saying, okay, we're going to implement some DEI strategies. We found out these are best in the industry or we're going to start adapting you know, whatever. That would be a bad idea. It's like prognosing without diagnosing. You need to know where you are. That's right. And I think the corollary to that that I think is super important, and it's probably the reason I get to have a practice out there alongside the Gartners and McKinsey's of the world, and the reason I can make a company change the way it runs in a couple months, which I think is a, a big thing to do, is the extent to which you bring things in on posters and new language and new models. The whole world right now in our space is very enthralled with models. I do the whiteboard videos about models. Here's a model for giving feedback. Here's a model for understanding what's important versus what's urgent. Those are good and well, and I, I'm an engineer. I like them. But when those models feel like they came from some consultant on the outside and they come with a glossy poster, physically or metaphorically, then that's a big signal to the immune system that, oh, this isn't from here. Uh, so we're going to pat this on the head and let it go by. To the extent that instead we can do things in the language of the organization and in the time frame of the organization and in the inner workings of the organization as they already exist, that's how we make really fast, really solid system change. I think that kind of quickness and solidity of the system change, it would be all the more helpful and supportive of the DEI system change that's coming, you know, with it or before it or behind it or whatever the roadmap said. I have a quotation from Ed Muzio. <laughs> I know him. Yeah. This is from that white paper I referenced. It gets at what we're just talking about from when I started this part. DEI work is systems level change work. It's not a one and done content training. If there's external pressures in our culture that says, hey, we need to start doing more DEI work, then we got to have some training. It doesn't seem that training is not there. You have to do, as we were just talking about, analysis because for DEI to work, it has to be at the systems level and the change has to focus there. Well, I think that's right. You know, you and I are both International Society for Performance Improvement kind of guys. Certainly from that perspective, you would never do anything before analysis. The only thing I'll push back on that a little bit is training is really good for awareness. It's good for building language. It's good for making action plans for things that are somewhat underway already. By that, I mean, you know, we're tilting toward DEI, or we're tilting toward organizational effectiveness, or we're tilting toward doing a better job of making nimble decisions. And so training can really be helpful in kind of moving that along. I wouldn't say that training is always the wrong starting point. Certainly, if we've done training and it hasn't moved the needle, more training is probably not the right answer, unless it's very, very different than the last round of training we did. Either way, what you're looking at is the question of how do we start to introduce into the system in safe and useful ways awareness and language and a sort of a structure for the need and a structure for what a solution might look like so that we can start to have a conversation about how to get there. That might look like old-fashioned analysis. So first, we just notice what's going on and, and make a list. Or that might look like some conversations that while we're assessing what's happening, we're also starting to communicate some of what's possible. I think any of that is okay in systems change, but I do think you don't want to just start with a push button answer to a problem you haven't defined yet. Absolutely not. I think you're right. You could be in an organization of navy blue suits and black ties, and you realize that there's something wrong, but you're not quite sure where it is. Maybe starting off, not a one and done, but starting the conversation can happen with some DE&I training to really start thinking about this differently. That may open up analysis just from the training itself. 
That's right. I think that usually if you're having a conversation, there is a need. If your conversation can start to help uncover that need and at the same time provide some language and structure for talking about that need, I think those tend to be very rich conversations. I think if the conversation is more sort of traditional salesy in nature in the sense that it's a set of solutions looking for a problem, sometimes they still match up and that's great. But I think that it's a little more challenging when you're talking about things that, as you said, are sort of hard for the person with the problem to articulate. I think then your chances of hitting with, with a predefined solution, they get a little lower until you can share some language, until you can share some high level concepts about, you know, what are we actually talking about here? For example, why is it so important that we're not making collaborative decisions? And what do we mean by collaborative decisions? Because we know sort of intuitively it's better to collaborate, but what does that actually mean in a meeting with a boss and some employees? What does a decision look like if it's collaborative and if it's not? Because you also can't take forever to make it. And you also can't make everybody happy and you also can't take three hours on everything. It gets complex. And I think that issue of language and discussion and framing things up in a useful way becomes more and more important. For where your culture is at, your approach may be very different. It could be that it's time to start resonating a DEI strategy across the organization get buy-in and move forward that way, or it may be more of an iterative thing where we're not at a place where we can execute a strategy yet. We're still trying to figure out where we're at, what we're doing, and what's wrong with us, or what could we be doing better? It becomes more of an iterative approach that leads up to building up to a strategy. I think so. Go slow to go fast is a great quote in a lot of ways, and I think it's a great quote here. Even though you know, and even though individuals inside the system can look and say, we're at a two, we should be at an eight, you're probably not going to jump system-wide from a two to an eight all at once. Yeah. So if you can say, well, we're going to put some work in place to lay the groundwork to climb one at a time for the next 10 months or whatever, if we can put some groundwork in place and have some conversation about it, then we can start to move forward with it. And I think that's another place where these ideas that I'm talking about in terms of environmental receptivity and behavioral flexibility come into play. Because again, you can start to put those in because they support de &I. You can put them in because they are helpful to output. You can put them in because you're going into a new market and need to be a little more agile and adaptable. You can put them in because people have complained for years on employee surveys that our meetings aren't very good and this would help them. You can start to seed the ground with other things that will help. To someone who would say, well, that slows down your focus on the DEI or the one thing, maybe, but maybe it goes slow to go fast because by doing that for this six months, then six months from now or a year from now, all of a sudden you're going to be able to plant this DEI seed and it's going to really grow as opposed to kind of struggling. I think it's worth thinking in those terms before you start. My thanks to Ed Muzio. If you'd like to learn more about Ed, go to the show notes. And if you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and leave a voicemail message for up to one minute. I'd like to thank those who contribute to the show. Your donations makes a difference because this is an all-volunteer service. I'd like to thank you for listening. This is Gary DePaul. Until next time, lead on.